Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to the Hinton Lecture, the annual lecture of the Royal Academy of Engineering. This lecture, as you probably know, is named after the late Lord Hinton of Bankside, the very first president of this academy uh, when it was established in 1976. Lord Hinton was one of the most eminent engineers of the 20th century. His career took him to the very top of his chosen field, power generation, culminating in his being appointed the first chairman of the now defunct Central Electricity Generating Board. Uh, this lecture has the purpose of exploring how engineering underpins our society and our economy through innovation. This evening, our lecturer is Lord Mandelson, First Secretary, Secretary of State for Business, Innovation and Skills, and Lord President of the Council. We are very much looking forward to what he has to say, and I'm delighted that what he said is after his lecture, he would like to hear from you, not necessarily questions, but just what you want to say, what an opinion you have, and he would much appreciate that. Over the last year, Lord Mandelson has repeatedly said that the UK needs less financial engineering and more real engineering, and we couldn't, of course, agree more. Engineers face both ways, face to science and face to commerce, solving problems while creating wealth. The global slowdown has focused attention on the need to rebalance and diversify our economy, and we need to refocus our comparative advantages including creating world-leading technology-based products and services. It is engineers as innovators, problem solvers and entrepreneurs who are going to deliver that future. As one of the handful of significant national academy, uh, academies of engineering around the world, we're playing our part, harnessing the expertise of our fellows to tackle issues and help attract the next generation of engineering talent. Across the engineering profession, we formed an alliance to promote innovation and support national policy through the best engineering advice. In all of this, there is a crucial role for government, and it's government that has to create the climate for innovation and enterprise to flourish. Lord Mandelson's theme tonight, Future Foundations Building Britain's economic strengths speaks, I believe, directly to this. So, Peter, we now invite you to deliver this year's Hinton Lecture. Well, John, thank you very much indeed uh, for that welcome, and uh, I'm absolutely delighted uh, to be with you. Um, following my speech at the Labour Party uh, conference this year, people, which I gather was regarded as a rather spirited um, contribution, um, I found that where, when I have spoken since, people have not been quite sure whether to expect sort of panto or policy or just plain theatricals. Um, you are going to get, I'm afraid, neither panto nor theatricals. You're going to, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, you are going to get uh, policy. Um, uh, which is what I care most uh, uh, about. And I'd like to uh, thank the uh, Royal Academy uh, for the privilege uh, of being invited to deliver uh, this year's uh, Hinton uh, lecture. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what motivated you, um, uh, but as someone who has spent a lot of the last year going around saying, as you have reminded everyone, John, that Britain needed uh, less financial engineering and more real engineering. I'm assuming that it's an invitation uh, to put my money uh, where my mouth is, um, or at least put a bit more substance where my soundbite is, um, and, that's, uh, and that's all the invitation I need. Now, I noticed the uh, other day that this year marks the 50th uh, anniversary of C.P. Snow's uh, Two Cultures uh, Read Lecture. Uh, I got my old copy down off the shelf and read it again uh, because uh, I wondered 
how the arguments that Stowe was making in 1959 about the place of science and technology uh, in our wider society might hold up now. And one of Snow's key worries uh, in 1959 uh, was, of course, that the standards of scientific literacy uh, in the British establishment and government uh, were low enough to pose a genuine threat to Britain's future. He worried that the most influential people in British public life simply didn't understand what he rightly regarded as the strongest force in British economic life, uh, which was essentially applied uh, uh, science. Now, by that, he meant the industrialization of production. Uh, our first tentative uh, steps towards understanding of the natural world at the atomic level uh, and, of course, the creation uh, of a physical, living uh, environment uh, that was more engineered uh, in its homes, uh, in its buildings, uh, its bridges, its roads uh, and infrastructure uh, than ever before in human history. That's what Snow meant. Now, he was not alone in seeing Britain uh, in those terms. It was, of course, only three, four years later that Harold Wilson told the Labour Party conference uh, that w Britain was being reforged in the white heat of a technological and scientific revolution. And given the pace of scientific change has continued, uh, unabated, uh, it is, if such a thing is possible, almost a constant revolution. What strikes me, and what I want to make the basis of my argument this evening, is that some of the key themes uh, in Snow's lecture do still resonate today, and that they still remain hugely important. Fifty years on, we are still trying to bridge the gaps between pure and applied science and between the worlds of science and technology and our wider society at the level of understanding and at the level of uh, engagement and application. Now, Snow didn't use the term, but he was angling uh, at the idea that Britain was becoming a scientific knowledge economy. This is certainly the case now. We need to understand more clearly than ever um, the way in which our pure science uh, and applied science underwrite our prosperity in our country, not least so we can strengthen their contribution to economic growth. The wider costs of any failure to do this are indeed very high, both for our own economy and society, but also globally. Snow was worried about how a scientifically illiterate society might fail to feed the expanding populations of the developing world. That concern is still with us very much today. Uh, and uh, to it, our society would have to add the massive problem of decarbonisation and the management of our environmental impact uh, on the planet. So while I don't want to be accused of you know, moving the rhetorical goalposts uh, late in the day, I'd like to suggest that my call for more real engineering could be understood uh, in the widest sense. In this century, there is an even greater imperative for Britain to be scientifically and technologically literate and capable of turning that technological literacy into sustainable economic growth. It seems to me that the low carbon transition alone makes the next generation 
of British engineers and scientists, potentially among the most important in history. We face the unique challenge of engineering at scale. We need to produce not some low-carbon vehicles and homes, but millions of low-carbon vehicles and homes. And a new low-carbon infrastructure and the thousands of engineers that will be required to make them a reality. It is our capacity to engineer and build on this massive scale that defines the modern challenge for us in the 21st century. But meeting that challenge and creating that generation of engineers poses a series of interlinked challenges for us in scientific and technical education, in recruitment into science and applied science, and in the ways in which we use the science to our collective economic benefit. How we can address each of these and the way in which government or public investment can and must play a role in each uh, is what I want to focus on. Now, the first thing that has to be said is that we are building uh, from very strong foundations in Britain in many ways. British manufacturing and engineering uh, have gone through a fundamental restructuring over the last 50 years, driven chiefly by leadership within the industry that saw the writing on the wall quite early on. They have moved up the value chain, focused on high-value-added production, often in niche markets and more in intermediate goods. That process of change has, of course, been difficult for us as a country because the shift towards services and rising productivity uh, and the pressure to shed jobs in labour-intensive industry uh, has seen manufacturing as a share of the workforce and of GDP contract sharply. But manufacturing, and forgive me for underlining this, manufacturing still accounts for a bigger chunk of our economy than financial services do. It is also our biggest economic export earner. I underline it because most people haven't the foggiest idea that that's the case. It has been strongly reinforced by unprecedented public investment uh, in our uh, science base, which will top £6 billion next year. That commitment to public investment in research is, to my mind, uh, one of this government's uh, greatest uh, achievements and, and pr principally testimony uh, to Gordon Brown's farsightedness uh, when he was uh, Chancellor. It has produced a research base and a network of research universities that rank second only to the United States globally and which are an immense asset to this country, which we are determined to protect and to preserve. That science base is increasingly a deep resource for innovators in business and in industry. In the last five years alone, UK universities have spun off almost a thousand companies worth almost three and a half billion pounds. But the fact remains that many British manufacturing and engineering employers still report shortages in STEM graduates, especially skilled technicians, either because the education system is not producing them or because they are taking their STEM training and their um, quantitative skills into the city or elsewhere, where the rewards, at least financially, are perceived to be greater. At least from a post-credit crunch perspective, it's hard not to see either problem in terms of a loss 
of genuine productive potential. There are other important challenges. Despite the impressive start-up and spin-off figures, there are still too many potential partnerships between industry and universities that go untapped. <coughs> and for all the depth and liquidity of Britain's capital markets, we still have, in my view, a structural problem with finance for innovation, especially the kind of innovation that needs patient investors willing to sit on their hands whilst concepts uh, are proved and perfected. Again, that's something that I believe uh, we have to measure in lost productive potential. And I'm just enough of a crusty old Keynesian to believe that the problem lies in part with investment managers and financial markets that might be good at knowing what's profitable in the short term, but are less able or willing to identify and invest in, in viable but long-term growth. Now, since I came back to the British government almost exactly a year ago, these have been the problems that have seemed to me to be key for our economic future. Key because they are critical for British manufacturing and engineering, and because preserving our strengths in these sectors is required for a balanced British economy. I also believe that they are problems that require active engagement and greater activism from government. I want to say something on each of these in turn. Firstly, on STEM skills. In the weeks ahead, we are going to produce our new frameworks for both adult skills and higher education policy. They will include new tools for tracking advanced uh, skills needs and demand in the economy and new measures for incentivizing universities and colleges to work better and more with business and industry. Not least in order to fill these skills gaps. That will mean clear incentives to increase and improve the provision of science, technology, engineering and mathematics courses. It will also create a system more capable of responding quickly with funding to fill niche gaps in the skills base in critical industries such as the civil nuclear uh, supply chain or low carbon technologies. We're also going to put a greater emphasis on routes to higher skills that can be built around work, flexible study, foundation degrees and apprenticeships. But it's going to be up to the industries that are demanding skilled workers really to drive the system by being much more clear and prescriptive about what it is they believe they need. Building collaborative relationships with universities and further education colleges is by far the best way to ensure that they are responding to industry needs as they evolve over time. Now some of the cost of this more strategic approach to the skills base will of course have to be borne by business and industry in the form of contracted services from higher and further education. But that investment will pay back in staff that have the right skills at the right levels at the right time. We also need something of a cultural shift in Britain, away from the pervasive belief that manufacturing belongs to this country's past. I hear far too often that Britain is a post-industrial country, and I hear it here, and I hear it abroad.
partly it's a result of the immense pull that the city uh, exerts, um, which is also reflected in the perception of Britain abroad, as I know only too well from Brussels, where the caricature of Anglo-Saxon finance-based Britain has currency, even uh, with senior policymakers uh, who should know better. Partly, it is the fact that the archaeology of industrial Britain, the vanished factories and the empty pits, are clear enough to see, while what replaced them is actually much less visible. British manufacturing in this century is more likely to be a sleek aluminium barn in a business park than a factory gate and a smokestack, but it is still there none the least. I think we need to work on our pitch for a new generation of engineers and applied scientists in this country. We have to make it more exciting. We have to make it more fashionable. We have to bring home to people that there are a number of pools in gravity and not just that one that heads to the City of London, important as that is. And that's one of the reasons we've set up Manufacturing Insight, to help spread the word. I think it's great that uh, companies on the CBI's Higher Education Task Force, like Balfour Beatty, Nissan and Centrica, all have active recruitment <coughs> strategies that include sign-on bonuses and clear career progression. The EPSRC funded PhD programs also encourage a clear pathway uh, into industry for highly trained STEM graduates. And above all, I think that the low carbon agenda has to be a golden opportunity uh, for British manufacturing uh, that will particularly excite and inspire people. Because it combines a huge economic imperative and commercial opportunity with a set of technological and engineering problems that literally require us to change the way we live within a generation. And we have an ecosystem of green manufacturers in this country, from the very big, like Rolls-Royce, to the smallest green startups that are tackling the problem from every direction. Now, second is the question of how we continue to drive up the rate at which we transform knowledge into manufacturing innovation. Again, I don't intend to disparage the progress of the last few years, uh, simply to argue fur that further tapping the huge resource of our research base to drive innovation and development is now one of the key challenges for Britain. We have got to do a heck of a lot better than we have been doing over the last recent years. And part of the future HE landscape, summed up in our new higher education framework, will include the new research excellence framework, which will, for the first time, explicitly recognise in its assessment the economic and social impact of excellent research, including the benefits of researcher collaboration with business or government. There will also be new support for bringing businesses and universities together to build long-term collaborations on research and development. These will build on the incentives that already exist through the HEFKI co-funding, um, innovation vouchers and the HE Innovation Fund. We've also been putting new resources behind the work of the Technology Strategy Board. An additional £50 million at the budget and more than that again in additional support for individual programmes this year. 
Through the TSB, we have funded a range of technology incubator projects, including the biggest demonstrator program for ultra-low carbon vehicles anywhere in the world. We have also funded a demonstrator facility for renewable chemicals in the northeast of England, which will allow small biotech firms to trial their concepts in a way that they would otherwise not be able to do. All decisions taken by government this year with public funds priming what we need to do, investing in our economic future. Now, we've committed almost three quarters of a billion pounds this year through our strategic investment fund to projects like this, almost all of them linked in some way to the low carbon transition. We're supporting Rolls-Royce's new investments in sites to research composites and new energy technology. We funded WaveHub in the southwest, which will be one of the world's most advanced facilities for testing new wave energy technology. We've put public investment behind the plastic electronics sector in the UK, which is already almost ready to take off. And we've supported the Stevenage Drug Development Innovation Campus that I announced uh, recently, a huge investment in our life sciences future and a great platform for the work of the Office for Life Sciences. Government, Wellcome Trust uh, and GSK. Now to start to address as well as the Regional Development Agency as well. Now, to start to address the finance problem for innovative companies, we created the Innovation Investment Fund earlier this year and are reviewing the delivery of capital to fast-growing SMEs. Chris Rowlands, the X3I's Chris Rowlands, uh, whose review will be completed very shortly. The principle that we've sought to establish is to use public seed capital to draw in private investment for startups and growing companies. The Innovation Investment Fund will start with 100, £150 million pounds in public seed capital and the ambition to draw in a billion pounds from private uh, investors. A fund that we would like to see in confidently expect will grow to a billion pounds uh, during the coming decade. Now these sums of money are not actually huge but the money itself and more importantly the wider policy approach behind it is a departure and it's a departure for one reason above all because it removes a negative check that has existed in this country for at least 20 years, spanning governments, both Conservative and New Labour, about the role of government in actively shaping our industrial capacities. It's time to move on and to adopt some fresh thinking. And I say that as one of the architects of New Labour. In the policy areas I have just set out, all of which will be critical, to the success or failure uh, of British advanced manufacturing and engineering uh, in this century. The role of government in partnering, partnering industry, getting the policy framework right and interventions in areas like skills, research and finance right uh, will be not just important but decisive to our ability, our capacity to compete in the global economy during this uh, century. Other countries on other continents have active government well sewn into the mix to capitalise on and build up their competitive strengths and don't I know it as a former EU Trade Commissioner. There's nothing that I haven't seen. Well, what's decent, appropriate and legal we need to do as well in this country 
uh, uh, in the way that other governments are doing to benefit their economies. Now, in part because of this unfunded notion of manufacturing uh, 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 decline in Britain, there is a caricature that says that government support for manufacturing must mean artificially propping up unviable industries or throwing money in the path of inevitable economic change and decline. I categorically reject this view. Modern manufacturing in Britain is absolutely viable so long as we recognise that, it, that our comparative strengths and weaknesses and what they are and distinguish between them and so long as we invest in the strengths and not the weaknesses. It requires intelligence. It requires smartness. It requires making judgments and choosing. And we in government have to equip ourselves to deploy that intelligence and make those uh, choices on advice from those who know better than we do. Modern manufacturing and engineering are built on a complex set of national capacities, and those capacities are in large part the result of what government does or does not do. Those who talk up British manufacturing but who are still stuck in the kind of thinking that says that government is always and everywhere the problem seem to me either complacent or naive or both. My challenge to the ideological critics of an active role for government is rather than reaching for the clichés uh, of 70s style national interventionism and public ownership, need to look at what we are actually doing when we talk and practice uh, 21st century intelligent uh, uh, industrial activism. In all of the interventions I've described uh, to you this evening, we've been disciplined, I believe, and we have been realistic. We haven't junked our commitment to long-term viability in an open market, that remains fundamental. But we have recognised that the market can fail essentially viable projects or technologies, especially at the earliest stages of development. We've also resisted the temptation to micromanage. We see a critical role for public investment, but have gone out of our way to avoid turning politicians or civil servants into investment managers or technology pickers. Funnily enough, that's not our training or skill set. And we should recognise it. The deployment of resources is effectively managed by independent technology experts like the TSB and venture capital and industry experts for funds like the Innovation Fund. Government isn't picking winners. It is making sure potential winners don't lose because the support they need isn't there. That's all we're trying to do. Nevertheless, even when the management of investments such as these is effectively at arm's length, I do believe that both government and the civil service now need to meet demanding new standards of technological awareness. C.P. Snow's basic warning against the dangers of a lack of technological literacy in government may be 50 years old, but I'm afraid it remains too powerful and too true even today. That does not mean just tracking technological trends or trying to keep up with the uh, technological zeitgeist. I've never twittered and perhaps I uh, never will, and I don't think it really matters either way for my effectiveness as Secretary of State. Rather, it means a much more fundamental understanding in government of how technological change is reshaping society and what the implications of technological change might be. At the very least, a greater understanding in government of innovative technologies is required for making credible judgments about what is essentially viable in Britain. 
It equips us to know where our skills and infrastructure weaknesses or regulatory barriers are putting technology development at risk and ensuring that we spot technology spillovers that can be exploited. The pace at which we can innovate and adapt to change will be critical. So government needs to be putting the minimum of obstacles uh, in the way of innovation and the better we are at understanding science and technology, the better we will be at doing that. I also believe that it will have an increasingly important role in helping us design and deliver cheaper and more personalised public services, especially in areas as healthcare. I believe this, that this demands senior level professional leadership within every major government department. Under John Beddington's leadership, we now have a chief scientific advisor in every major science using department. And this is a significant step forward, but John and the chief scientific advisors need to be supported by networks of civil servants who are literate in the full range of science and engineering subjects. Their challenge must be to keep raising the technological literacy of policy making in government and to act as the eyes and ears of government with the technology industries. And whatever the name on the tin, we are very clear that our chief scientific advisers must also cover engineering. A number of Whitehall's advisers have engineering backgrounds and I have to say that I believe that should be seen as a strong qualification for such posts in the future. So let me just say this to you uh, 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 conclu in conclusion and let me finish with the soundbite with which I started. Less financial engineering, more real engineering. What strikes me about this phrase is that every time I use it, audience heads start to nod like this. And many of you were no exception this evening. We all seem to know intuitively what it means, or rather what it aspires to, for this country. A skill for making things does indeed run very deep in Britain. And it is something that still has great emotional pull and power we sometimes feel we've lost it, and it is absolutely vital that we understand that we have not done so. I want to be very clear that I am a cast-iron supporter of the financial and business services industry in this country. I believe in the city's role as a global financial centre. Of course I do. I think people respond badly to the idea of financial engineering because they sense that some of what went on in the city over the last few years has just been highly lucrative intermediation, not something that produced anything real. Certainly not after the bill for the taxpayer arrived. You can take that argument too far in my view, but there is a germ of truth to the fact that in our country a lot of money has been put into the money industry over the last decade when it might have been used to make things instead. However, I also think that our concept of making things needs to be a very wide and broad one in the global economy in which we are seeking to make and pay our living. We trade in ideas and knowledge above all. And those ideas can be everything from a product or a component, to a service, to a film, to a video game. Even in manufacturing, what we do best is often the design and the marketing at the top of the global value chain. This is the global production model that defines globalisation. And it plays well to Britain's strengths, so long as we invest in them and in those global supply chains. We've always been Britain. We've always been our, as a country out there in the world. Being part of global supply chains should be no surprise and no stranger to us and what we've always done best in our country.
It just requires further adaptation. And as I said, although I do mean it literally, I think we need to see the idea of more real engineering in a broader sense, in the sense of a society and economy that understands and respects and gets the best out of science and applied science. And that's why I started this lecture by invoking the two cultures and C.P. Snow. Think for a moment of the major challenges of the decade ahead. Climate change, public health, communications, transport, international development, the list goes on. In every case, our scientific and technological literacy, as C.P. Snow put it, will be the measure of our capacity to meet and overcome these challenges for the general universal welfare of those who live in our world. That is our collective challenge. Thank you very much indeed. Peter, th thank you very much for that uh, very powerful set of uh, ideas and positions. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, before the uh, uh, lecture, Peter said what he'd like to do would be not only to have questions, uh, because perhaps you really want to do something rather different. You'd like to mark his card with something you have in your mind. And so, rather than dress it up as a question, why don't we get straight to the business of the evening and do just that? And so I'll take them in groups. You can identify who you are and say what you do, if you do anything. Uh, then that will be good. Otherwise, just say who you are. And, right. I'm Michael Kelly, who recently completed a term as Chief Scientific Advisor. And my one comment, I think, that gets at the biggest challenge we have over 40 years, the renewal of the civil infrastructure could well benefit from the university and higher, further education sector as a whole grabbing this problem institutionally and saying we'll get there by 2035 and show the rest of the world the way. The real problem among the building trades and the small companies is that they're looking for leadership. And whereas I can get 20 million pounds to do research on carbon sequestration, I cannot get 2 million pounds to do research on external cladding materials for terraced houses because there's no route to market. And until we get something where the university sector as a whole, or something on scale in the country, grabs this issue and produces a new rhetoric, I think we're going to be missing an opportunity. Great. Thank you. Alec. I'm Alec Brewers. Uh, and these are microphones, I think. Is this working? That's, it. That's what the gentleman at the back was telling me. So you need to speak into that. <laughs> that one? Is that working? Yes, yeah, that's, that's working. The button in the middle. <laughs> you spoke about timeliness with education. I think timeliness is an issue that we have. Uh, and I think government can set targets and time scales, perhaps, if not picking winners. The thing that worries me a lot, and I think we've talked about this in various contexts in, in the House of Lords, and that is why we set ourselves such leisurely uh, timescales in certain instances. Why is it that we're going to take till 1918 to build a nuclear power station, a new one, uh, when the Chinese are doing it in half the time? Why is it that we only have a few uh, tens of miles of high-speed rail when most modern countries have more than this and our civil engineers are more than able to do this uh, as demonstrated, for example, by the fact that they're ahead of schedule in the Olympic site. Uh, I think we lack ambition and, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. We should set ourselves more ambitious targets. I lived in a world of, of electronics. If you were late with your product, it didn't exist because the competition was there ahead of you and yours was no longer needed. I'd hate to think we as a nation might no longer be needed. Barbara, in the front here, please. I'm Barbara Judge, and I'm chairman of the U.S.
I'm sorry, like that. The UK Atomic Energy Authority. And I'm concerned about the lack of women in engineering and in science. We start out with women who are good at math and good at science in schools. But what happens, or at least what seems to happen, is the school teachers and the parents send their smart, scientific, math-oriented women off to be doctors, which is a good thing. But we don't have, and so we have a lot of women who are in medical school and in doctors. The problem is we need women, we need them in science, pure science, and we need them in engineering. I believe that the numbers around the Royal Society of Engineering are woefully low in the number of women who make it in that field. And I think if we leave it the way it is, it will stay woefully low. We need programs within the schools, within the universities, and within the companies that will fast track smart women and give them a role that they can play early on so that they make it through those early times that are so difficult for women and go on to the top levels. Because we cannot ignore half the country's population if we're going to keep engineering at the forefront. Thank you. Bob Malpas. My name is uh, Bob Malpas. I need a device. Unless you can hear me. Okay. Uh, thank you, Lord Madison, for talking to us, and thank you for prototyping our cause throughout the nation. We sorely need it. Um, I belong to the category of do-nothings, as John was suggesting earlier on. Um, and he also suggested that we mark your card. Uh, and if I may humbly, sir, mark your card in a constructive way. Uh, you related, you talked about engineers and making very frequently throughout your excellent talk, you hardly said the word design. In fact, I think you said the word design once. Engineering is indeed about making and making better. But engineering is, and here is the fundament of engineering, engineering is about designing. And the phrase for me should be designing and making, not just making. A helpful suggestion, I hope. Thank you. Take, uh, it's actually the hand up has been John Armit right at the back there. Being very patient. And John Armit, uh, chairman of the ODA, and uh, Alex was kind enough just now to press the button, John. Press the middle button. That's it. <laughs> and hold it close to your mouth. <laughs> Is that better? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, Bears was kind enough just now to refer to the fact that uh, at the Olympics things were moving apace. Um, they're moving apace for, uh, particularly because the planning uh, procedure there has been uh, very effective, and I think that's an area which uh, government has already tried to address, um, and hopefully we will be able to continue with the proposals which the government has put in place. But I would like to really pick up uh, this issue of targets and ambition. The uh, a whole series of things have, done, have been done better at the Olympics in terms of environmental improvements, in terms of the employment of apprentices, and uh, these have largely flowed from the setting by government with ourselves of targets which have then been passed on to the industrial sector. And the industrial sector have actually responded positively and have worked to meet those targets, not only in terms of numbers of people employed or reductions in CO2, but even at the cutting edge in areas such as producing PVCs, which are a non phylate uh, PVC. And we're getting very close to achieving that. So my suggestion is that the role for government, particularly in the climate change area, is to be very clear in setting targets in the long term, because if we set targets in the long term, then I think we can actually get more investment because investors, if they can see that there are going to be real business opportunities because there are real clear targets which industry has to meet, not which are optional, but which have to be met, and in fact we can make some real progress. But there is a requirement to have some very clear long-term targets which are mandatory on industry and business to achieve. Thank you. Thank you. 
So, right by the pillar there. That's it. Uh, in your chair. How can possibly be heard? My name is Ian Gardiner. I'm retired. My career, which ended 25 years ago, was spent in the heavy electrical and mechanical engineering field. I think I am happy to have heard what Lord Mandelson has said by way of his proposed support for industry, particularly manufacturing industry. But I can't help being very sad by thinking that one of my favorite statistics is that two British manufacturers delivered a locomotive to India every 14 days for 100 years. We look around today. We're importing locomotives which are American designs made in Canada. We're importing high-speed trains from Japan. All our rolling stock south of the Thames is German, and I could go on. But I hope that whatever government gets in next year, we will have some real encouragement to retain what is left of our manufacturing industry. We'll take a seventh one, uh, Sir Kevin Tebbit. I think it, uh, we'll take the I one in front. Really, I spent most of my career in urban public transport projects, <coughs> and latterly as the head of the civil engineering department at Imperial College. Apropos real engineering versus financial engineering, I'm so glad that you are waving the flag for us, Lord Mandelson. But I trust you do not present real engineering on our behalf instead of financial engineering. The problem of Snow's two cultures, as I understand it, was that it presented uh, the issues in an either-or fashion. And I think that was detrimental to his argument. We often also include, uh, uh, exclude the great importance to engineers of what are called the soft skills necessary for the delivery of engineering outcomes. So I would urge you, when you are happily positively waving the flag for engineering, and I think you may perhaps agree with me because I heard you say towards the end of your presentation the term, you use the term engineering in its broadest sense. You will <coughs> help us to define engineering in its broadest sense of being technological and financial and involving interpersonal skills. Thank you. Peter, seven yeah. statements. Right, I mean, l let me say, first of all, uh, on, on, I absolutely take your point on, on design. I mean, I, as I said, but it should have, it, I mean, design is, is not an add-on. It's fundamental across the piece, and, and, uh, and that was a point that was very well uh, uh, made. Look, um, I also said um, that, that I, I, I'm not against financial services or financial markets. They're really important. Um, what I don't want to have is uh, financial engineering running away with itself, not least when it's using other people's money uh, in order uh, to do so in a rather excessive and reckless way, resulting in a huge hole being blown in our GDP in this country. Mm. I mean, let's not forget what we've lost. I mean, a whacking great hole has been blown into our GDP as a result of what happened uh, in the banking uh, sector. Uh, and we are going to be living with that, as other countries are, uh, for many years to come. And of course, I mean, one of the um, uh, preoccupations I have, as I said, is not just uh, skills uh, being delivered into engineering. It is finance uh, being delivered uh, into, uh, I I into innovation. So I'm absolutely uh, uh, with you. Engineering equals technological 
plus financial, plus softer uh, skills, uh, as, as, as you put it. Absolutely uh, uh, with you. And it's finding the right joins. It's, it's, it's making sure uh, that these activities, uh, which are so interdependent, support each other more effectively, that in my view uh, is at the heart uh, of any responsible, half-enlightened government's growth strategy uh, and plan uh, for the recovery and sustainability uh, of our uh, economy. And uh, I, I believe, uh, as an extension of this, that markets are not going to do that job for us alone. It's all the point I'm making. I mean, it's almost so elementary, it almost doesn't need making. Um, but g given the history of the last sort of 20, 25 uh, years, uh, and I played my part in this, New Labour played its part in this, uh, we were so um, um, keen to establish our pro-market credentials in the 1990s. Mind you, we did have quite a lot to live down in the 80s and the 70s. Um, uh, but, uh, this is off the record, isn't it? This, uh, this I don't know. So suddenly, as I sort of drift on into a... suddenly realise I'm in a public place. But anyway, um, um, I completely lost my track now. Um, that, 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 that it, but it was important for us to establish those uh, credentials. You know, markets are fundamental. You know, would, you're never going to replace markets, should, nor should you seek to do so, as the ultimate arbiter uh, 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 of what goes on and what's decided in our economy. You're not going to have some alternative uh, system uh, uh, to replicate or to replace you know, the billions of decisions that are taken as a result of the working of markets uh, in our economy. Uh, but equally, you have to acknowledge and understand that markets don't do the whole job, that secondly, markets sometimes don't work perfectly, and that thirdly, markets don't always correct themselves in the way that it is assumed uh, that, the, the, uh, 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 that, they, that they would do. Uh, and that is why... Uh, you need uh, a government coming into the mix, not just to regulate in the way that um, you know, uh, governments in a rather more time-honoured sense have assumed is their job in relation to markets and the economy, but also to help in the creating process, the joining up process, uh, to cement that interdependence, particularly, as I said, when you're talking about uh, early years uh, innovation and those early joins and steps and bridges that need to be put in place uh, from your science base, your research base, uh, uh, to uh, what is uh, commercialized and then industrialized. Uh, and that uh, process does not work in a seamless way. Uh, and all I'm arguing is that we just need a slightly more intelligent, imaginative way uh, of understanding uh, 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 the role government uh, has to play and to be in it. I, mean, I, will, I will make this point to you. I hope it's not overly political. Um, w one of the things that concerns me in this country is that every time there's a change of government, you know, there's a change of philosophy or a change of course or a change of direction. Uh, we can't afford that. I mean, one of the reasons why in 1997 we were arguably a little bit you know, more sort of infatuated with markets than looking back we might have been, is because we wanted to lend continuity uh, to some, not all, but some of the policies uh, that had been practiced uh, in the 80s and the 90s. I don't make an apology uh, for that, by the way. I just think it's intelligent uh, politics. Um, next year we will have a general election, uh, and I have a real fear. It, it, it's not the People like me will lose office, although that, of course, from a personal point of view, would be a terrible calamity. Although, <laughs> although I must say I have got used to it uh, during, <laughs> uh, 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 since 1997. Uh, um, um, uh, but, that, but that should another government come into office, suddenly, you know, we're back to sort of year zero all again. Now, I'll tell you what one respect in which I really feel this, and it, it, it relates to... Um, uh, God, I'm, I'm looking uh, now. Um, 
uh, slightly at what uh, uh, Alec uh, uh, said uh, and what uh, uh, and what John said, John Armit about you know uh, uh, targets. Why don't we do things faster in this country? Why aren't we more ambitious? Why don't we achieve our goals uh, more speedily? Well, one of the reasons, one of the reasons, is not actually a lack of ambition. Uh, it's the most god awful planning process and set of procedures uh, 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 amongst any uh, developed country. And we have introduced legislation, as you know. Uh, we now have a system of national planning statements for key infrastructure uh, uh, projects uh, so that we can accelerate or uh, uh, fast track. And, again, I'm not making a, a party political point, um, sort of. Um, <laughs> If the Conservatives are elected, they are committed to repealing all that legislation, all the, planning leg all the fast track planning legislation, all the ways in which we finally, after 10 years in office, arrived at the conclusion that we needed uh, a, a different planning system in this country. Uh, the opposition is committed to repealing the legislation and reversing what we've put in place. Now, this would be a disaster. Uh, uh, for us, and somehow they've got to, you know, should, in, the, in the unlikely event of them being elected, um, they've got to be headed off at the pass. Now, otherwise, that speed and that ambition and those that 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 infrastructure, you know, uh, your uh, nuclear power stations by 2018, you know, say goodbye. You know, you're going to have every sort and vestige of nimbyism growing, sprouting out of the. Uh, uh, ground, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, without any, uh, uh, without any buy or leave uh, uh, about it. And uh, anyway, um, I haven't responded to all the points. Of course, Barbara, I would like. I don't know how to get uh, uh, more uh, uh, women in engineering uh, and, and science. I don't know how to dissuade more of them from becoming doctors and, and engineers. Um, all the people here have better ideas, uh, will have better ideas than, than, than I have about that. But, you're, you're, but I just make this last point, and it, it relates to uh, Mr. Kelly's point. I've lost Mr. Kelly. Mr. Kelly's point right at the beginning about uh, routes to market. If, you, if government creates a framework of policy um, for example, in relation to building requirements and conditions um, uh, and the revolution that we've got to see uh, in that for, for our efforts to fight climate uh, change. And people know that that framework of policy is going to be stable, that it's predictable, that business knows what to invest, invest in, uh, how to take, how, how, where to concentrate uh, research and its commercial and its application and its commercialization because they know that that target or that framework is going to remain stable and there'll be no alternative uh, but to producing the cladding materials and that that is the route uh, to market because you know that isn't going to change that's what we've got to do in this country uh, uh, better uh, and frankly there are many continental European countries uh, where this is operated much more effectively, I'm afraid, uh, uh, than we do uh, here. You know, they get an idea, they create a policy, they put the legislation in place, wild horses doesn't uh, uh, make them depart from it, and business knows where it stands, and the markets then create themselves. Ladies and gentlemen, I think the <coughs> clock now shows that we've been just over an hour, and that is the time allocated for the Hinton Lecture. Uh, all it uh, remains for me to do is to thank Peter Mandelson for being here, uh, for giving us a lecture, and to responding uh, to these points in a way which is, uh, I believe, uh, coherent with the wishes of everybody. That is, uh, that we remember that economic and social value is created by getting things done, and getting things done which go beyond just an idea or a pure, simple uh, notion, but actually delivering it in an applied way. And that is what we're all about here, I believe. Uh, and this lecture, I believe, spoke into that. Peter, thank you very much for coming. It's a great lecture. Thank, thank you. you.